So, how do you define yourself? How many people here would consider themselves educators? Okay. What about learners? I feel like that's everyone. <laughs> what about athletes? Any athletes in the room? Want to be athletes? Couch potatoes? Netflix and chillers? <laughs> so I could go on and on, but the point is that we define ourselves in large part by the things that we do, our everyday activities. I'm an occupational therapist, and we define our everyday activities as occupations. So occupation, in this sense, isn't just your job or the thing that you get paid to do. It's anything that you do that matters to you, that makes a difference, that helps you to define who you are. So occupational therapists, for those of you who don't know, help people across the lifespan to do the things that they want and need to do every day, and we do this through the use of occupations as well. We also have an academic discipline called occupational science. And this is where we study how our everyday activities actually impact our health and our well-being. So, because the way that what we do affects how, who we are and how we live,、uh, our discipline is really diverse. We have people from anthropology, sociology, psychology, neuroscience, molecular biology, everything.、Uh, but we consider this the science of everyday living because we basically are just trying to study how what we do every day affects who we are. I think I speak on behalf of all occupational therapists when I say thank you for having us here.、Uh, we are so excited about this conference and this theme of everyone included and patient-centered care because that, to us, is the basis of our whole profession.、Uh, we can't do a treatment session without asking the patient first, "What matters to you? What is it that you want to do today, and how can we help you to get there?" So when we walk in, we ask, "What matters to you?" and not, "What's the matter with you?" Uh, we like to start with actually taking what we call an occupational profile or occupational history. So we'll say, "So, tell me about yourself. Who are you? What is it that you like to do?、Uh, what are you doing every day?" And then we ask, "What challenges are you facing now? And how can we help you get there?" In that sense, we really feel like we're more just collaborators with them in their care and in helping them to achieve their goals. So you might say. That sounds great, but doesn't that mean that what you do is really diverse? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, it is. So every time,、um, so I work with patients who have stroke,、um, and no matter who it is, even if I worked with ten people who all had a stroke,、uh, if I asked if I asked ten people in this room what matters to you, your answers would all be different. And that is the same with every single patient and client that I see. So therefore, what we do is really different.、Um, sometimes we're helping them just to get back to their normal daily routine. Sometimes they want to use that opportunity to try something new, or they want to reinvent themselves.、Uh, in this case, this is a picture of Nate Higgins. He is a、uh, pro swimmer. He had a spinal cord injury,、uh, but before that, he defined himself as an athlete. And after his spinal cord injury, he still defined himself as an athlete. And a large part of his care and recovery was making sure that he could go on to swim, and continue to call himself an athlete. So Nate actually has swam across Alcatraz. He swam faster and further than most people in this room,、uh, and he's gone on to inspire so many people with his story. So, I think the real question then is: If what we do every day is so different, how do we teach our students to do this? So we do the same things that most、uh, medical professions do. We teach about the diagnoses we commonly see. We teach about the etiology, the treatments. Uh, we teach about the mechanisms, the neuroscience, the, the kinesiology,、uh, but we also teach about task analysis. And so that's how we take any given task that somebody wants to do and break it down, so that we can incorporate that into therapy.、Uh, so, for instance, if somebody has had a stroke but they want to work at the automotive shop where they worked before, we do all their therapy laying down on their back so that they can simulate what they were doing、um, when they were working on a car.、Uh, and so we do task analysis in those ways. And then the most important thing I think is we also bring in experts into our classroom. So this is Dr. Samia Rafidi. She's the director of our、uh, master's level clinical program at the University of Southern California, and she's done something that I think is really fantastic. What she says is that any instructor can teach about disabilities out of a book, but only somebody with the disability can speak to the lived experience, and in reality, they are the expert. 
And so because of that, she brings experts that we call community mentors or experts into the classroom. Oh, whoops. Okay, so in this picture, this is Steven. He's a community mentor from Rancho Los Amigos National Rehab Hospital. Um, here he's teaching one of our students. Uh, he's just showing them how he does everyday life. So he's showing them how he drives his car using hand controls. He shows them also how he transfers in and out of the car. He does this at Rancho Los Amigos because he is a person who has had a spinal cord injury, and he teaches people who have new spinal cord injuries how he gets around and how he does things. Uh, but the thing that I think is the most important about this is that when Samia brings them into the classroom, the first thing they do is spend about 30 to 45 minutes just talking about themselves. So they tell the students who they are, what matters to them, what they do every day, what they like to do and what they don't like to do, just like you or I might to anyone else. Then they start to talk about the challenges that they face. Um, what challenges does having a spinal cord injury pose to everyday life? And then they go through uh, the things that they've come up with because they're the experts in their life and how they've uh, worked to resolve those issues and overcome them. And I think this gives the students the, the concept and the idea that every patient is going to be a different case, a different scenario, and they're going to have their own solutions and that it's really important to listen to those. I think, though, that this is a little bit preaching to the choir. <laughs> All right, so in this case, what if you can't have an expert come to your classroom? Well, this is where I think technology really comes in handy. This is Dr. John Margettis. He's an assistant professor at USC and also an occupational therapist, and he also was born without hands or feet. So John is fantastic because what he decided to do, because people were always looking at him and wondering how he does things, <laughs> he just said, ta-da, <laughs> if you couldn't hear that. So what he decided to do is put videos of himself doing different things online. So he put this on YouTube, and it trended on Reddit, which he was very excited about. Uh, it has about 78,000 views now. And I think that the real beauty is that this is how technology can influence and bring the expert story to the classroom and to the masses. One other thing I wanted to talk about is virtual reality. So how many people here have tried a virtual reality headset on? Some people, many people, most people. Well, if you haven't, I think there are tons of opportunities here for you to do that. <laughs> um, so there's lots of really great and interesting use cases for virtual reality in medical education. A lot of them I think you'll hear about or see here. Uh, things like being able to simulate an environment so you can simulate a surgical training um, without actually having to have a cadaver. You could simulate a chaotic emergency situation and have people practice decision making. But the thing that I think is the most exciting about virtual reality is something that we call embodiment. It's the fact that you can actually embody the person that you're given in virtual reality. And that is really interesting. So um, Dr. Mel Slater and Mavi Viva Sanchez from Barcelona have done tons of work on this, where they, they actually did this before VR was a thing, before there was any hype to it, uh, and when VR headsets cost about $50,000. So, they put people in VR and they gave them all sorts of different bodies. In one case, they gave somebody an, a body that had uh, the right arm four times longer than the left arm. And they show that people actually embody that body and start to interact with the world as though their right arm really is super long. And even after you take the VR headset off, they still act like they have this really long arm uh, until they get back to the real world. They also show that if you give somebody a child's body in VR, they start to show more childlike behaviors. Uh, if you give somebody different gender body, they start to show behaviors for that gender. It's fantastic and it's super interesting. And it means that we can give people experiences, first-hand embodied experiences, that they might not normally be able to have. So one way this is being used in medical education, and which might be talked about here, uh, is through simulations of the lived experience of people with different disabilities. So I like this example. It's called the Alfred Lab, and it's created by a company called Embodied Labs. Uh, and basically what happens when you put on the headset is you become Alfred, a 76-year-old uh, male uh, who goes through his daily life but has macular degeneration and hearing impairments. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that, similar to what I was saying with Samia and, and John, experts actually help to make these scenarios. They help to tell the story in virtual reality, and they make it so that you're not just focused on what the disease or disorder looks like, but how it affects your everyday life, how it affects the way that you have a birthday party with your family, or when you go to the doctor, what that looks like. For my lab, so I'm also a neuroscientist, and we do a lot to try to help people recover after stroke. And so one of the things that we thought is if you can give somebody the experience of someone with a disability with virtual reality, 
then you potentially could also give somebody who has a disability the experience of not having that. So with VR, we've created a system that we call reInvent. It's a rehabilitation environment using the integration of neuromuscular-based virtual enhancements for neural training. We mostly did that just to have the acronym of reInvent. <laughs> we, we only ever say that on, on talks. Okay, so what happens normally for, uh, in typical individuals is you might think to yourself, I want to pick up this cup of coffee, and you would generate a motor command, and that command would get sent from your brain down to your hand, and your hand would move, and you would pick up the coffee, and you would see that you had picked up that coffee, and you had done it right, and that command in your brain would get reinforced. However, after a stroke, what happens is that sometimes that motor command gets attempted, but it doesn't make it all the way to the hand. And so even if it was the right motor command, uh, nothing happens at the hand, and your feedback, your visual feedback, doesn't reinforce that command because you didn't see anything happen. This is a problem because then if you have this type of um, disconnect between the brain and the hand, there's no way to train it, and there's no way to tell the patient if their brain activity was right or not. With reInvent, we've created a low-cost, portable brain-computer interface. So what we do is we actually take the signals from the brain and the muscles that indicate that the person is trying to move, and we give them feedback in virtual reality of an arm actually moving. And because it can be embodied, they can actually feel like they have control over a virtual body, even if they can't control their body in the real world. So we think this is not only really rewarding, it also activates neural circuits that are um, native and biologically efficient, um, and it also gives them feedback so that they continue to train and practice those brain connections that we think will promote motor recovery. This is what our system looks like. We recently had the opportunity to show it off at South by Southwest, which was very fun. Uh, but it's a low-cost portable system. Uh, it just consists of a laptop, an Oculus Rift, and an EEG and EMG headset. So the EEG goes on your head, and it's actually a $9 swim cap that we got off Amazon, and we just poked holes in it, because usually EEG headsets are tens of thousands of dollars, so ours is less than a thousand. Um, and then we have some uh, sticky electrodes that we put on the arm. And to the right is one of our, our friends, Ian, trying it on. We call him the happiest man in VR. <laughs> All right, so one of the things that we had to do was try to understand first what the experience of an older adult was in VR, right? So if most of our users were going to be people who are older, what do they like? This is a 99-year-old woman who's in VR for the first time. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. That's really great. This is really beautiful. It's fun, huh? Oh, yeah. This is so gorgeous. <laughs> the butterflies are so pretty. Oh, I love All right, so that video is mostly gratuitous. <laughs> it's just the cutest thing that we've ever seen. Um, and a lot of people in our lab were super jealous that a 99-year-old woman got to try VR before they did. <laughs> um, but actually, her message and what we learned from this experience of bringing VR to older adults was pretty consistent. It turns out that they don't love roller coasters and flight simulators the way that younger generations might. But what they do love is nature and being outdoors, and they love birds and butterflies and seeing nature uh, interacting with it. So we use that to design the environment. So this is a picture of what you see in VR, except you don't see the GUI. Um, but you have an orange hand, which is a target hand, and then you have your own hand. And you can move that hand to the target hand in a few different ways. If you have movement, you could actually move your hand. Uh, and if you, don't, if you aren't able to move, you can control that hand just using your brain activity or your muscle activity. And when you do, um, I think it's a video, but I'm not sure if it will play. When you do, uh, a hummingbird comes and flies to your hand, and you have this rewarding sound. Okay. So, in, con in conclusion, I just want to close with a quote uh, by the late Dr. Ann Neville Jan. So, Ann was a colleague of mine. Um, and I think that if she had known about this conference, she would have been amazed. I think this embodies everything that she would love to have seen, because Anne um, was a professor at USC, an occupational therapist, and a disability rights advocate. Um, and she also was born with spina bifida. And when she was born, the doctors told her parents that she didn't have a good chance of having a fulfilling life. And she definitely proved them all wrong. <laughs> so Anne is somebody that I think went through life sharing her story, talking to everybody that she could, and she really paved the way um, for a lot of work in this area. Um, and so I just want to leave you with this quote from Anne, uh, in which she says, disabilities add twists and turns on the road of life, 
but the road nonetheless stretches before you if you're game. Thank you.